um, when he was actually in the chancery, in uh, the Reich Chancery, in, in, when his officers were there, he, he didn't have one office to represent him. He had five, because he liked his subordinates to fight amongst themselves for supremacy. And this went through everything. He had this sort of feeling that if he didn't intervene, if he didn't actually touch a decision, it would probably be all right in the end, and therefore he didn't need to do anything. Now, I think to a certain extent he may have had a point, but when you're trying to fight a fucking war, it probably pays to pay a little attention to it, particularly if you're totally paranoid that your generals are trying to kill you all the time, which they weren't until he said, I'm totally paranoid you're trying to kill me, at which point Steppenberg tried to kill him. That's by the by. Adolf Hitler had almost no control day to day. What he did have was very, 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 very long dinners with people, during the course of which he would rant about everything under the sun. And he'd have these dinners with large numbers of Gauleiters or regional commanders or members of the army or members of the SS or members of political organisation, whoever really pleased him got invited to dinner. Great honour, you get to, to, to have dinner with a beloved Führer. Um, at which he would say things like, we have too, mentally, too many mentally handicapped people in the world. We have, this Jewish question is still facing us. And people would come back to him with various proposals. The one, I picked those two in particular because those were actual comments that he made during the course of dinner parties. One of which was picked up on by Himmler, who took a letter that had been written to Hitler. And, by the way, Himmler worked very, very hard to fight off people like Heydrich, who worked for Himmler, um, to control Hitler's post precisely so he could do this sort of thing. Anyway, he got this letter, he took it to Hitler at the right moment, he said, Adolf, look at this. This letter was a letter from a guy in Germany writing to the glorious leader, and this is pre-war, saying, my son has been born hideously handicapped, and I don't think it's fair for him to carry on living. I don't think it's fair for him to carry on living for him because he's in pain, or for the state because he's going to have to pay. Please, Hitler, give me permission to have my son killed, which Hitler duly did, because Himmler presented the letter at the right moment. Within 12 months, it had gone from one-off case to Nazi official pol policy to get rid of people with mentally, mental issues, to getting rid of orphans. It had gone from a situation where there was a form that had to be signed by four doctors that had to be approved by the Reich before it was actually carried out after the doctors had all signed it, to a situation where there were no checks and balances and where they began to develop the gas trucks, which we will come back to, Harvey, we will come back to the gas trucks. Oh my God, yes, I can hear you shouting, just chill. The point is this. It was an environment in which, because Hitler was never stepping in and saying, I want this to happen in this order with these people involved, what he'd say is, I want a situation like this to be the end result. And everybody would run around and go, OK, how can we please Hitler the most? How can we make him happiest? We need the most extreme solution we can possibly go for, because that's what he likes. And we need to do it as quickly as we can, because that, that's what he likes. And let's not to worry too much about the consequences of what we're doing. And any situation like that breeds extremism because there was no checks and balances on the doctors. It wasn't actually somebody going to Hitler saying, well, let's kill lots and lots of orphans. But it was a group of people saying, well, what if we did this? The logical extension of doing A is B is C is D is E and so on. And you wound up with a situation where they'd gone from one kid being killed through to thousands being killed. And that is the way that Hitler and Nazi Germany operated. And it meant that the idea of the final solution wasn't really crystallised until June 1941, when Barbarossa really kicked off. That in turn meant that any part of this idea that we get in schools about Hitler having said, this is the final solution, like this from the beginning, is utter balls. He had said, I want to get rid of the Jews. It was other people who then said, how do we make Hitler happy? And then it was Hitler that basically signed off the budgets. He became aware of what was going on. We know about it because we broke all their codes and we have copies of pretty much all of their radio traffic. We know exactly what was exchanged between army headquarters, between the air force headquarters, between the camps headquarters, and between Berlin, because we have transcripts of almost everything sent by radio. Not everything, but almost everything. And we know exactly 
the sequence of events because we have evidence from most of the people that were involved in that hierarchy. And you know what? Most of that was outside of Nuremberg because, this is the other part of it, Nuremberg itself was a series of politically motivated trials. Oh, look. It was a way of making sure that Stalin got what he wanted, which was to kill everybody involved with the Nazi hierarchy, and Churchill got what he wanted, which was making sure everybody appeared to have a fair trial. And the Americans went along with it because it seemed like an expedient thing to do at the time. And it was certainly a lot easier to justify to their population, oh, look, we tried them in a fair way, then we just dragged them out of the street and shot them, which, frankly, I'm kind of with Stalin on this. I, I don't really know why we bothered to question them first. But anyway... Okay, so that's the setup for this. Right. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, I haven't actually addressed the, the statistics vary bit, um, and I've been talking for ages. But anyway, I'll carry on. The statistics vary piece. Right. I said to you at the beginning of this, the Nazis collected good data. I said to you at the end of this, that post-war, the data is variable. And that's fundamentally where a lot of these come in. The other part of it is that most documents were destroyed. We bombed, and we, I mean the British, bombed the shite out of Germany during most of the last couple of years of war, we really gave it a good ass kicking. It was getting so bad that by 1945 and the Dresden bombing, which we'll come on to, um, we really didn't have any targets left, which is one of the reasons we bombed Dresden. Um, there wasn't that much left. Then we had two enormous land armies fighting the biggest land battle ever fought on two sides of the continent to drive for, into the middle of Germany and then Berlin being wiped out by the, 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 the Russians, basically what was left of it, and, and pretty much everywhere else being taken out by the Allies, a lot of documents were lost in the process. And that means that some of the documentary evidence isn't as strong as it should be. Some critical documents did survive. Um, what it actually means is it's very hard to know for sure the precise numbers of people that were shipped to any camp. What that does not mean for the Holocaust deniers is that none of it ever happened. What it means is precise numbers are difficult, broad numbers are relatively simple, and when you start to get down to how many people were killed at, say, Treblinka, it's difficult to know. You, for example, during the course of your video, regularly batten around Treblinka, killed one third of people. Mm. Okay. I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, I think at best you can say it was roughly one-seventh because it was one of the big seven death camps. Arguably, the Einstatzgruppen, who were operating prior to any of these camps being built, actually did the majority of the killing. And I'm not going to worry about the mechanics of how that happened. If people are really interested in this, there are some links on the side. You can go and have a read of them. Please enjoy. Um, they are very, very hard reading. I do not enjoy reading them at all, and I'm certainly not going to get into the mechanics of how the Holocaust happened. There are many people that have covered it far better than I have. So, call a halt underneath that. This is the introductory bit. Oh my god, it's very long. I'm now going to go into Let's Take Apart RV's video piece by piece.